The study of chemistry is a study of matter and how matter changes or undergoes transformations. And there are two main ways in which matter can undergo change. One is via physical changes and one is via chemical changes. A physical change in matter is a process where the form of matter may be changed without changing its chemical identity or its chemical composition. So, for example, the cutting of a piece of paper or the grinding of peppercorns or the bending of an aluminium bar are examples of physical changes to the form of matter, where, importantly, no new substances are formed. And that's a key characteristic of physical changes of matter. No new substances are formed during physical transformations. A chemical change of matter, otherwise known as a chemical reaction, involves a change in the chemical identity and composition of matter, where one or more kinds of matter are transformed into a new kind of matter or several new kinds of matter. And we see the results of chemical reactions around us every day. For example, the burning of a candle or the spoiling of milk or the growth of plants via photosynthesis. These are all examples of chemical reactions where new substances are formed. We'll start by looking at physical transformations or physical changes of matter. One of the most important types of physical change is a change of state. So, for example, the melting of solid ice to produce liquid water or the heating of liquid water to produce water vapour are examples of physical changes of matter where no new substances are formed. We can represent these physical changes of state in this diagram here where we can see the physical transformations that take place between solids, liquids and gases. For example, we know that we can transform a solid to a liquid via the process of melting. Going from a liquid to a gas is known as evaporation and we can condense gases back to their liquid state by, for example, lowering the temperature. Similarly, we can freeze solids to transform them from their liquid state to the solid state. Melting, freezing, evaporation and condensation processes should be familiar to most people as everyday occurrences, particularly in association with the changes of state of water. For example, when we boil water on our cooktop or freeze water in our freezer. Typically, most substances are transformed from the solid state through the liquid state via melting and then to the gas state via evaporation and vice versa going from the gas state through the liquid state to the solid state. However, under certain conditions of temperature and pressure, solids can be transformed to gases without going through the liquid state and a direct transformation of a solid to a gas is known as sublimation. The reverse, a transformation of a gas directly to a solid without going through the liquid state first, is known as deposition. Now, not many substances undergo sublimation or deposition at room temperature and pressure, but one common substance that does do it is carbon dioxide. Solid carbon dioxide, otherwise known as dry ice, at room temperature and pressure will sublimate and change directly from the solid state to the gaseous state of carbon dioxide without going through the wet liquid state, hence the name dry ice. When considering physical and chemical changes of matter, it is important that we have a clear, concise and consistent way of representing these changes or transformations of matter. Whether they be physical transformations or chemical transformations, we can use chemical equations to do this. Chemical equations are a shorthand notation or a shorthand way of representing both physical and chemical transformations. Chemical equations use chemical formulas and other symbols as a shorthand way to represent chemical substances. So, for example, we can represent water in the solid state, otherwise known as ice, by using the chemical formula H2O and putting the little s subscript next to it, indicating that water is in its solid state. We can represent water in the liquid state with an L subscript, and we can also represent water in the gaseous state using the lowercase g subscript to represent water vapour. And we know we can transform solid ice to liquid water by heating it. So the plus delta sign on top of the arrow pointing to the right indicates that we are adding heat to ice to physically transform it to its liquid state. Or we can take heat away from liquid water to freeze it and transform it to its solid state. So the negative delta sign indicates that we are taking heat away from the system. Similarly, we can add heat to liquid water and transform it to the gaseous state of water and we can take heat away 
from the gaseous state and condense it to liquid water. So this shorthand notation, this chemical equation here, is a shorthand way of describing all of those processes all at once using chemical formulas and other symbols such as arrows, subscripts and plus minus signs. As far as chemical changes in matter are concerned, a chemical change, otherwise known as a chemical reaction, involves a change in the chemical identity or chemical composition and one or more new types of matter are formed from other types of matter. And that's the key here. New substances are being formed. Here we have an example of a chemical equation representing a chemical reaction, namely the combustion of hydrogen in the presence of oxygen to produce water. In this case, two kinds of matter, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, are transformed into a single new kind of matter, water. In chemical equations, each substance is represented by its own chemical formula, H2 for hydrogen, O2 for oxygen, and H2O for water. The physical state for each substance at room temperature and pressure is designated by the subscripts S, L and G, representing solid, liquid or gases. The plus sign in a chemical equation means reacts with, and the arrow means transforms to or changes to. The Greek capital delta above the arrow indicates that this particular chemical change needs a little bit of heat to kickstart the chemical reaction. The substances on the left hand side of the arrow are known as reactants and the substances on the right hand side of the arrow are known as the products. The big numbers at the front of the chemical formulas are called stoichiometric coefficients and they are there to balance the chemical equation. And we will go into balancing equations in more detail a little later on in this video series. This particular reaction also involves the release of a considerable amount of energy in the form of heat and light. Reactions that have a net release of energy to their surroundings are known as exothermic reactions and the heat of reaction, delta H, is said to be negative. Heat is lost from the system to the surroundings. Balanced chemical equations generally do not include energy inputs or outputs and only include representations of material substances or matter, so they typically only include the chemical formulas of substances. The opposite to an exothermic reaction is an endothermic reaction and the thermal decomposition of limestone or calcium carbonate to produce lime, calcium oxide and carbon dioxide is an example. For an endothermic reaction, net heat is required from the surroundings for the reaction to take place and the heat of reaction or delta H is therefore said to be positive. In terms of providing evidence of a chemical change or a chemical reaction, we can look for some telltale signs the most obvious being the creation of one or more new substances or products from a given set of reactants. This is often but not always observed by noting changes like energy changes. So for example, does the chemical reaction produce light or heat energy or does it require light or heat energy to proceed? The production of gases is another telltale sign. Many chemical reactions produce gases and it's often hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen or carbon dioxide that are the gases that are produced. Colour changes are often an indication of chemical changes or chemical reactions, as are changes in odour. If you note a change in the smell or odour of a system when you mix reactants together, the chances are you've had a chemical reaction taking place. I just want to say one final thing about chemical reactions and in particular in terms of the differing properties of reactants and products. Here is a written form of a chemical equation representing the reaction between the elements sodium and chlorine to produce the compound sodium chloride. We can represent this reaction via a balanced chemical equation like this, where we have two lots of sodium solid plus one lot of chlorine gas being transformed to two lots of sodium chloride solid. It is important to note that the properties of reactants are always significantly different to the properties of the products. For example, sodium is a soft, very reactive, very combustible metal and dangerously explosive when exposed to air and water vapour. Chlorine is a greenish gas, also highly reactive. It's a strong oxidising agent and it was actually used as a poisonous gas during World War I. So both of these reactants are highly reactive and highly dangerous. But when they combine, they produce sodium chloride crystals, which are so benign that we sprinkle them on our fish and chips because sodium chloride is otherwise known as good old table salt. 
So that's just one example showing when new types of matter are formed in a chemical process, the chemical and physical properties of these products are generally vastly different to the chemical and physical properties of the reactants from which they are formed.